Luftwaffe. Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Alan, John McClane killed Welcome back to Chat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question, were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental blockbuster video? Do you know what blockbuster video is? If you answered yes, then this is the podcast for you. I am one of your hosts, Gene Lyons, and alongside me are my co-hosts, Ash Benny Herdig. Hi, y'all. And Big D, Dick Ebert. Good evening. And each week, we take a look back in time, decide if our favorite films still hold up. The movies we cover are chosen by you, the listeners, who generously commission the films you love. If you like to see all the movies we have covered, we'll cover one to choose one for yourself. Please visit shadpod.com and have a look. At the end of each podcast, we'll provide you, the audience, with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. It's how we help the podcast grow. Additionally, subscribe to our sister podcast, Chat on TV, where we review TV series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, True Detective, Lovecraft country and watchmen find all the information and past episodes at shatpod.com slash tv and finally to hang out with us live follow and subscribe to our twitch channel shatpod.com slash twitch where we play video games host watch parties and edit this podcast live all that being said big d what movie are reviewing today gene tonight we will be closing out the month of mark who's commissioned three movies and tonight is his final and possibly his best yet he asked us to go back to 1993 and review the alternate reality timeline dystopian Nazis won the war Philadelphia experiment part two. Well, Mark wrote in one last time and said, hey, Shat Pod, like Big D, I was obsessed with time travel movies and TV as a kid and adolescent. Quantum Leap probably started it all. So when I stumbled upon Philadelphia Experiment 2 at our local mom and pop video store, I know it was right up my alley. Not only did it include time travel, but also a modern day U.S. ruled by Nazis and a jet stealth fighter covered in Luftwaffe insignias. Does this movie hold up today? Not at all. The acting is stiff as a board. The digital effects are laughable, and I'm sure it includes every dystopian fiction cliche possible. Yet considering, I'm sure I was the only one who ever rented Philadelphia Experiment 2 from our local video store, let alone multiple times, it will always hold a very special place for me. Plus, I think the weirdo bad guy still holds up pretty well. I'm sure Philadelphia Experiment 2 will get the best wipe score. I'm predicting 3.5 yep. to 4 or so. I still hope it will be fun to talk about. Look forward to hearing your thoughts. Warmly, Mark from Minneapolis. Mark, I feel like this is the perfect movie to close out 2023. <laughs> it's perfect. Because there are those movies that we all rush to the theater to see. And there are those movies that became cult classics that we all discovered later on after there was buzz about them or that friend in college told you you really had to see it. But then there were these movies that we just stumbled upon at various points in our life. Maybe the cover art intrigued you at the video story, so you picked it up. Or maybe it was on you know, USA or Cinemax or something like that, and you happened to see it. And parts of it stuck in your brain. And although I didn't see Philadelphia Experiment 2 as a kid, I definitely know that if I had seen it, there are scenes in this movie, concepts in this movie, performances in this movie that would have stuck with me forever. So this is, in my opinion, a terrific Shad movie. Philadelphia Experiment 2 is a 1993 science fiction film and the sequel to 1984's The Philadelphia Experiment. With an entirely new cast and only two characters returning, it stars Brad Johnson as David Herdig, the hero from the first film, and Garrett Graham in a dual role as both the main villain and his father. The film was a box office bomb, bringing in less than $3 million on a $5 million budget. So Big D, Ash, we always ask what your memories are of the film. This week, it is The Philadelphia Experiment 2. Ash, let's start with you. Yeah, very simple. My memories are nothing. Um, I had never seen The Philadelphia Experiment 1. Thus, I had never seen The Philadelphia Experiment 2. But thanks to Mark and this podcast, I have now seen both. Unlike you, Ash, I did not go back and watch the original Philadelphia Experiment because I thought I had already seen it. <laughs> In fact, it was another film that we've done for the podcast called The Final Countdown. I watched the entire Philadelphia Experiment 2 thinking that the final countdown was the Philadelphia Experiment. And it still somehow kind of made sense to me. I also thought the first time I saw the lead man, Brad Johnson, <laughs> Biff Riprock, that we we're going to get some like USA up all night, softcore porn scenes. Because when you see actors that look like this 
and act like this, it's because they got great bodies and we're going to see a lot of them. Mm, thankfully, that was not the case. As Mark mentioned, I love most time travel movies with with very few exceptions. Now, I don't need much, right? Not everything has to be a big budget. You don't need to have stars. You don't have to be filled with excitement. It doesn't have to be a twist on the genre that we haven't seen before. It doesn't even have to make logical sense. I will overlook almost everything. But a movie's got to be fun. It's got to be fun. So that being said, I never really enjoyed the Philadelphia Experiment, the first one. So I never went back and watched this. This was a hole in my time travel viewing, and I can't believe that I did not watch it. If you look at the poster, we can all agree that poster is kick ass. Yeah. I think it's compelling. You've got the stealth fighter. There's some kind of like it looks like a beam of light where Brad's beautiful face is in the background there. This says watch me. I never did. So, Mark, thank you for this kind commission. Uh, to fill in that hole. And I'm going to see if I was wrong all those years ago. And this was something I should have watched. This is one of those rare movies that we do where the budget for the sequel was smaller than the budget for the original. So Philadelphia Experiment, the first one was like $9 million. And they said, ah, let's do a sequel, but with a third of the budget, get Brad Johnson on the phone. See what we can do. Nothing says we have more confidence than slashing the budget and getting Brad. (laughs) Let's hit the trailer. Bottom of the ninth. Base is loaded. The bitch. Oh, and he's out of there. Lucky catch. They were inseparable. I know it's been tough. I know you miss your mom. I miss her too. But you and me together, we're a team, right? Until a top secret military experiment. Imagine being able to move an object from point A to point B quickly, silently. Safe! came between them. I give you super stealth. They're much further along than I thought. I'm getting the hell out of here away from you and whatever it is you're doing. Generators online. Now. Now. What's going on? David's taking a trip. This project has progressed to the brink of disaster. Seven. Six. These experiments are tearing him apart. He never imagined. Two, one, engage! Catapult. Into another 1993. What's the date? May 3rd. What year, damn it? What are you, stupid? 1993. Peacekeeper Air Cav picked up an unauthorized presence. Find him. All right, everybody out of the bus. This is a security ID check. Where an accident of history has turned America. VA Day. Victory over America. 50 years since the Phoenix bomb Washington. Where have you been all your life? Into a dark world of fear and oppression. It's a nightmare here because here was not meant to be. It never should have happened. Find him, Decker. Keep him alive and bring him here. Now David must risk everything. I gotta get back to my son. And find the one way back home. Terminate him. The Philadelphia Experiment 2. Nine years after the events that thrust David Herdig into 1984, his wife Allison has died because she won't come back to do a sequel. And David is living alone with their son, Benjamin. David is in financial trouble, but refuses help from Professor Longstreet, the original project director, in exchange for rejoining the U.S. Navy. David has also been having painful experiences that Longstreet rationalizes as stress-related hallucinations. Unbeknownst to David, Longstreet has been doing some research of his own. So I'm going to say full disclosure here. I did not pay to watch this movie. I watched it with ads through Freeform on uh, my Amazon Fire TV. And uh, the first 10 minutes of this film prior to the commercials, because if you've never watched it before, it's literally like every 10 minutes there is a commercial break. Thankfully. So the first 10 minutes... Right, thankfully. <laughs> no. They're depressing as fuck, right? Like you're in this crazy, sad, and disheveled therapist <laughs> office when it opens with a very strange, like, distance between the therapist and patient. It was like an entire office bay between the two. 
There's like 50 yards between these dudes, and every shot is getting closer and closer to their faces. Like at one point, I was expecting yeah. to see like just an eyeball. <laughs> well, and behind him, the books slowly get more disheveled as as it goes, as he squeezes that squeezy thing. But, you know, you're in this office. It's dark. There's a fan casting shadows on their face. And then you go to this very, again, dark, kind of like 1980 Soviet control style room. And I know it's not the Soviets, but that's what it looks like. There's lots of red and beige going on, right? And so it's got a tone that's very clear. And I'm like, okay. I get what this movie's going to be. And then the first commercial kicks in. And it was a commercial for Paramount Plus and then a commercial for Ozempic. And then all of a sudden, I think it's another commercial, maybe for like a, I don't know, a parenting resource or something like that, because it's this happy, sunny baseball field with this uplifting music. <laughs> and I'm going, well, but this looks kind of old. And then I realize, oh, shit. This is the the movie. So I rewound the movie thinking maybe with the commercial, they cut a significant amount out between the first 10 minutes and where it picks up. But no, there's just this weird shift. And then guess what? It happens again because they get home from the baseball field and David is so stressed out and he's yelling at his kid and putting his glasses down all dramatically. But then he's up. And the music swells and he's throwing curveballs with paper, right? Like, it is so confusing how I'm supposed to feel while watching it. Not to get too deep, Ash, but perhaps this is a statement on parenting in the 90s. Maybe there's an artiste at work behind the scenes here <laughs> at the Philadelphia Experiment, too. Because our parents had these soul-crushing office jobs in drab, right? That's David when he's at the therapist's office. And then they had these cold offices, you know, that's the control room. But then they countered that by building these suburban homes with green kitchen tile and rooster statues everywhere, indoor awning and kitschy aprons that say kiss the cook and, you know, that chalkboard with the fat Frenchman announcing the meal du jour. And that's the baseball field. Those are the brighter, sunnier moments. It felt as if there's two options. You either had two directors where you said you go you go film the sunny happy scenes. And Ash, I don't know how you watch this with commercials cuz it would have been a warping experience. The home baseball scenes, they feel like a commercial for like Eloquest. Nothing is everything. And the people are running around. It feels like a pharmaceutical commercial. <laughs> This feels like footage of a never released existing like Hallmark film, like something called like <laughs> My Father's Keeper or Diamonds in the Rough. Something where there's a story about like a father and his son and he's he's having like some kind of like battle with either alcoholism or drugs or mental illness. I think someone, an editor with some voiceovers could cut up all the baseball portions, the bright parts of this movie, and create at least a 30-minute after-school special about substance abuse or mental illness and re-edit it. So, Gene, I went back to our good friend, ChatGBT, because I said, please no. help me with this. And we've come up with a couple quick ones in here that I think would be surefire hits. We've got Diamonds in the Rough. It's in this idyllic town, young Ben's journey unfolds against the backdrop of America's favorite pastime, baseball. Raised by his mentally ill father, <laughs> David and Ben find solace on the dusty diamond as dreams are born and friendships are forged. There's a couple ones like Hearts of Harmony, I'm not even getting into you, that talks about the, him, the widower and battling hallucinations and, and having their friendship bound by their love of baseball. But the best one I got to go straight to, it's called Fields of Courage. <laughs> and this is a hallmark film that we could create. In the tranquil town of Harmony Springs, Navy veteran David battles not only the scars of war, but the hallucinations and blackouts that strain his relationship with baseball-loving son Ben. When Emily, a caring little league coach, steps in to see past David's struggles and recognize that not all wounds are visible. With the sort of support of the community, Ben joins a team and the healing power of baseball becomes the salvation for both father and son. Fields of Harmony, a poignant Hallmark Channel movie, celebrates love, resilience, and the therapeutic magic of the baseball field. Everybody, 20 years from now, when we realize that our robot overlords used AI to go back in time and win World War II for themselves, and we're all working in the underground salt mines, I want you to know it's because Big D put in the plot from Philadelphia Experiment 2 into Chat GPT. <laughs> I fed it the idea. I've incepted it. 
<laughs> and it's rare that we get a time travel movie where someone goes forward in time. I think that's what really made Philadelphia Experiment a little bit different. In nearly every time travel movie we've covered, the protagonist goes back in time. At least initially, it kicks off events, right? And there are all kinds of benefits there to going back in time. You can relive your youth, like in Peggy Sue Got Married. Uh, you can use a sports almanac uh, to get rich betting, like in Back to the Future. Uh, you can ace your history report, like in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Going forward in time, though, the reason why a lot of movies don't do this is because it's not so great. If you go forward in time, let's say 50 years, all your friends are dead or they're incredibly old, they wouldn't recognize you. Your job skills are likely outdated. The kind of jobs that they have 50 years from now, you don't know how to do, you never even heard of them. The environment is worse. Inflation makes you poor. Let's say you could even access your bank account. You would have essentially nothing. It's no wonder David is so bummed out. I don't know why you would ever want to go forward in time and then stay there. Yeah, I mean, you'd have absolutely no idea how to behave, right? Uh, I mean, I was talking to someone just the other day about how much has changed just in the last 10 years. Like, I wouldn't know how to use a phone. I wouldn't know how to look up anything. I wouldn't know how to find information. Um, I, you know, I, I mean, you just use ChatGPT, right, Big D? Like, I would have no idea how to use ChatGPT just like a year ago. And I know how to use it now and it terrifies me. So I don't. Um, like, I feel you give yourself away very easily going to the future. You can pass if you go to the past. I mean, that's what that whole show Outlander is based on, right? Like, she basically researches and goes back with antibiotics and that's how they're able to survive. I, I think that, you know, you would not be able to do that if you're going into the future and then you would get arrested and killed and it would just not go well. But a movie could be fun. If you think about Back to the Future Part 2, they go into the future. We get to see future tech, even though they're they're kind of outdated in their knowledge. It's exciting to see. We get none of that in, in going forward. No, a movie can be fun in that way. Like Encino Man is fun, yeah. but it's rarely beneficial to the person who's moving forward in time. Oh. It, it's always harder for them. If you go back in time, it's relatively easy. Well, I think if, if technology and medical sciences has, has, say you're ill and you wanted to jump forward to maybe longevity, there could be life could be better, but it doesn't always have to be a, a dystopian hellscape. There's that kick-ass comedy, Jenny's Got Cancer. They sent her for 40 years and they're like, hey, now you don't have cancer. I think it was called Stage Four. Yeah, yeah directed by John Favreau. <laughs> He's got well, in a demonstration, engineer William Mailer, son of Nazi scientist Friedrich Mailer, outlines a strategy to teleport a bomber into a high-risk area to surprise enemy air defenses. But Longstreet manages to convince the panel that the technology is too dangerous to use. However, Longstreet himself was the man who gave Mailer the necessary equipment for test purposes, revealing the truth behind David's recent symptoms. David, furious to learn that Longstreet has lied to him, Packs to leave California. So much like I famously did in Last Action Hero, I found myself in Philadelphia Experiment 2 rooting for the villain. The actor Garrett Graham, who looked oddly familiar, although I haven't seen any of his other movies, I looked it up, or any of his Star Trek appearances, he plays this driven American defense engineer, Mailer, who makes a, a pretty compelling case for why we have to push the boundaries of stealth technology to the next level. Like, he doesn't have any nefarious intent in doing this. And I'm buying into this. He's got a Cold War motivation. We got to stay ahead of the Soviets. Honestly, I found myself liking him a lot better than David, who's just this, like, mopey cornball we're supposed to root for. You know, when I sat down to do my notes for this, one of my buckets was going to be how just – horribly unlikable David is in this movie. We spend the first 30 minutes with him complaining and looking like he's all put upon. He's boring. He's whiny. Like, at least Graham has ambition. Like, at least he's trying to do something. And there's this great thing that the director does where there's these, like, askew camera angles from below to show, like, when he's very serious. And it's fantastic. It's funny and probably in what is an unintentional way, but it works. And his only brown and beige wardrobe with like the red accents, they're great. They're they're fantastic. Like it's your consummate movie villain. Um, my only complaint for Graham and the entirety of like the the bad guys in this is the name for the device. Like super stealth. Like really? Like that was the best you could come up with was super stealth. Oh, it's you you can feel when there are experts on set. I guarantee there was no scientific advisor. There was no military expert in the writing room or on the set because this movie is dumb, 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 dumb. 
And I was shocked. For I couldn't believe. I'm, when First of all, when you see the stealth fighter, the Lockheed F-117, the Nighthawk, I'm thinking, holy shit, did that exist in 93? I was always thinking it was a more modern aircraft. Going back, it went public in 83. So this was much older than I had, had realized it. And it was 10 years later here that the movie is 93. People know how stealth works. Why would you choose to call it super, super stealth? This is obviously teleportation. It's not cloaking. They say cloaking, super cloaking. They're making it worse. And then they shoot the high-tech laboratory in what looks like an oversized boiler room in a basement. It's obviously what they could afford, a refinery or some kind of metal works. They look, they sound ridiculous. The scientific exposition that they do is, is atrocious. It is like... Go to Vector 9, Ventura Quadrant. What are you doing in Sector 3? This position is a violation of Code 3 law. Of a depleted area. It's a joke. Our old rule, Gene, if you can't make it, fake it. Just don't show us. Just talk about the tech, make it blinking lights, and we'll buy it. What's great, too, is when they're on the verge of doing something very, very dangerous, which is testing this thing on an actual F-117 that is in flight, and the, the naval officer is talking to Mailer, and he's like, are you sure we should do this? Is it safe? He's like, look around you. Look at all of these resources we poured into it. <laughs> yes. and it's a fucking boiler room. <laughs> and, and Big D, you mentioned that that tech, the F-117 being from 83. I mean, our current bomber fleet, right, is B-52s. And B2s and B2s look pretty futuristic. Like you've seen it. It's like that flying wing looking thing Uh, that was developed in the 80s as well. But the solution that the U.S. has come up with in making a new generation of bomber, it's not to fucking teleport them, right? These moves are generally incremental. That's how warfare works. And so they just what we have coming up is the B21, which basically just looks like a baby B2. And it has, yeah, it has more advanced skin and it has more advanced electronics and other aspects. But if you look at the problem they're presenting in this movie, they're like, oh, the it can be detected now by acoustical uh, detection systems, right? And what the U.S. has done to counter the fact that systems have become better at detecting aircraft is just make it smaller. Like, it, it make for a boring movie, right? They're like, hey, it's Philadelphia Experiment 2. We made a smaller plane. <laughs> also, maybe choose a less dangerous first test subject. You're going to do this off on your own. Don't pick the one with a live nuke. Just pick a a regular like fighter jet or a transport. Don't take a stealth fighter with a nuke. You're asking for problems. A car, a box. Yeah, anything. I'm just really confused the entire time by like the science of the time travel. And no, I mean, before we get somebody writing in, I'm not asking for the science to be perfect in a time travel movie. I'm just asking for it to have some semblance of sense like at all, because what's happening here is ridiculous. So I mean, let's break down. If you've never seen it before, right? David's DNA, we find out is being literally ripped apart because by traveling through space and time, he's become his own space time continuum i don't even know how to begin to explain that and then doing these experiments somehow are feeding on his space time continuum and they do all of this with like this weird like limpy like stranger things 11 style bloody nose whenever the experiment is done and he just kind of like goes uh, and like he throws his head from side to side and that's how we know his dna is being dismantled it's a pretty big stretch like even for time travel in my opinion and i i'm like you big d in mortal Kombat, right like i need some explanation here that's gonna make sense of some kind because i need like a time flux device like back to the future like something to make it feel like this is grounded at all in any semblance of reality uh, I'm still thinking about this jet thing. Um, so <laughs> if you could teleport a thing, why not just teleport the bomb? Yeah, to where you need it to go. Why do you need a jet at all? Yeah, but Ash, to answer your question, I, I, the, the idea is that Mailer, the scientist, doesn't fully understand the technology. So I think he thinks he's just going to move the F-117 in space, but he doesn't realize that there's this pole that was never broken between David and 1943, as they would describe it like a hole in space time, right? So the more power Mailer throws into the zapping device, the stronger that pull becomes with David and a time portal. Now, it doesn't explain why David goes to 1993 
instead of 1943, which is where you'd think it would return him, or why it looks like the Black Hole Sun video, or why his <laughs> nightstand stays in the exact same spot despite Germany occupying the United States for 50 years. He, t- he teleports to alternate 1993. The nightstand is still there. The yeah. whole fucking sector is blown to shit, but his nightstand still there for him to lean against. Dude, they built a full factory in his doorstep. <laughs> the front of his like door is a giant facility, but yet his nightstand is still there. Those Nazi zoning laws. I think that Mailer knew what he was doing. No. It was a ruse for the Americans, the people there, his like his little people helping him. I think he knew it was going to happen because he wanted to get his father back. He wanted to vindicate his father's what happened to him. I think he that's what happened. I think he was doing it intentionally. But again, you're overcomplicating this. You don't need the multiple factors of the DNA timeline, your personal. It's it's complicating something that doesn't need to be. It's too much. And with every time travel movie, we have this concept of why you have to go back to your time. What your motivation is for traveling time in general. Big D mentioned for Mailer that maybe he wants to go back and vindicate his father. Philadelphia Experiment 2 establishes for our protagonist, David. His Westworld cornerstone, his raison d'être, is Benny, his son, Benny. He has to protect Benny. Benny matters so much to him. He has to travel time to find Benny again, okay? He has to show us those sweet baseball moves because Benny. He even tells Benny at one point while they're sitting in an old-timey car, because you got to do that in the 90s, sometimes I don't get to spend as much time as you as I'd like. Nothing about the movie supports that, though, because when they do get the opportunity to hang out, David wants to do literally anything else than hang out with his son, Benny. He's balancing his checkbook, which was my mom's way of telling me mommy needs quiet time. He's working on like half a dozen cars in his front yard. He's making these gourmet hamburgers from scratch, which I guess is supposed to show us that he's from 1943. Dude. Crazy idea, right? You get on that fucking phone, your 1993 phone, you order a pizza. You go play with your kid. The pizza shows up. You boys eat and you keep playing until the sun goes down. You're going to have a happy Benny. Because he looks like he's deteriorating. Each time the experiments go on. Oh, I thought you meant Benny. No, not (laughs) Benny. Dad. Dad, Like For all intents and purposes, dad has a terminal illness. Yeah. His time is, is finite. Right. Like you said, Gene, spend every moment you can... I was more concerned with the way he was lashing out. It wasn't just, I don't have time to play paper ball batting practice in the house with you, Benny. It's he lashes out violently. Go to your room, son. I was like, wow, this is getting dark. The kid fucking drops a baseball on the carpeted floor and David has a fucking meltdown. Yeah, and there is no connection when they're driving the car and he goes, hey, dad, adamantium is the strongest material known. Somebody tricked this kid into getting a Mercedes ornament and dad's like, can't play along. Superman? I don't know what the dad, maybe, maybe the dad is deteriorating to the point where he can't connect and he doesn't even realize this might not even be his son. Do we know this is really his son? Well, they definitely don't look anything alike, right? Like, it looks like they, like, had no casting budget and they had to just, like, hire the first kid who comes in. Because, I mean, David and Benny, like, there's no family resemblance, like, at all. All. And and I think to your point, you know, Gene, I think that, you know, we're supposed to get, you know, that he's got, you know, carrying literally the weight of space and time on his shoulders. So, like, he wants to go play with Benny, but he can't when it's removed, spoiler alert, at the end. That's why he's able to be a good dad. Oh. <laughs> When Mailer uses the technology to transmit an F-117 Nighthawk, the aircraft does not rematerialize. David feels tremendous physical pain and finds himself in a different 1993 on the run from a heavily armed military team. He is rescued by Jess, a member of an underground resistance group, who explains that Nazi Germany won World War II and is about to mark 50 years of Nazi rule over America. Germany won the war using a futuristic aircraft called the Phoenix to deliver atomic bombs, but the Phoenix was destroyed in the explosion. Gene, you just said he finds himself in a different 1993. How could that not be fun? How could that not be wild? Earlier on, you said traveling forward. Yes, it's bad for the person, but for a movie audience, this should be great. It should be awesome. It gives you such freedom to create a fun narrative. You're traveling forward. It gives you the opportunity. Let's build an alternate 1993. 
doesn't cost money. You could do it in a lot of fun ways. Have people sit down and say, how would the world be different? Have either of you watched Apple TV? They have a series called uh, For All Mankind. It's gone on four seasons. Yes, it's excellent. With Joel Kinnaman. Yes. It, the King B hates. What it tells you is it says, what would happen if in the last days of the race to the moon that Russia beat the U.S.? All the different little steps that it would change. The butterfly effect, will it be? You know, the butterfly effect is that, you know, the U.S. falls behind, the space race continues, it alters history, and they build this world of an alternate timeline. We only see the videos of the propaganda. Wouldn't it be fun if in those videos you got to see propaganda newsreels highlighting the 50 years under German rule? Maybe Yankee Stadium with Nazi flags. Instead of, you know, you have David asking the rebel girl, do you know Reagan, Bush, Carter, Elvis, Superman? No, she doesn't, dude. She's in an alternate timeline. But provide us one where maybe Bob Hope is running tours for the USO of the Nazis. Elvis singing Nazi propaganda. A, a Nazi Superman. This could have all been fun world building shit. Yeah, I mean, I think the idea of these alternate realities are always hit or miss, right? Like, I think the man in High Castle is your consummate example of like it's something that works when you show Nazi rule, you know, that they they won the war basically. But I have to tell you, up to this point in the movie, I was not loving it. I thought it was pretty terrible. I was kind of begrudgingly going through, appreciating the commercial breaks when they came because then I could do my notes. But then they got to the alternate reality and. Uh, begrudgingly, I found myself like starting to have a lot of fun in this movie because I kind of dug their take on this alternate World War II ending. You know, you've got the hilarious chanting when they get to that facility of procreate, hygiene, happiness completely out of nowhere and you get this classic nazi look but it was really smartly updated to the 90s for the 50th celebration you know where it looks like they are living in the 90s but like if the 90s of a world of hitler if that was a, a thing and for me i finally felt like the movie wasn't taking itself so seriously and i started to be like okay well you know maybe this is why you know mark loved this movie so much and at first, you find yourself asking questions like, why isn't everybody speaking German? And why isn't this exactly like the Nazis that we know from the 40s? Because it's 50 years later. This actually makes sense. If the Nazis won the war and Germany had occupied the United States, it wouldn't be exactly like Germany. People would probably still be speaking English. There would just be changes here and there. And then you advance 50 years, right? And so this kind of makes sense. Now, would they have the same technology that we had? Probably not. That's a little weird. Uh, for instance, like the aircraft shouldn't exist at fucking all in this world. Point being, Ash, as I agree that this alternate reality was, I think, fun enough with the budget that they were allowed. You know, they, I think, spent their money in really smart places. Like the sets look really cool in this part. Like it feels like, it feels like this is where they spent their time world building. And because of that, you get these really incredible moments that I loved because, like, they're like, they're fucking bonkers, guys. And a perfect example of that is when we get Mahler sitting in his office and he's got a 10 gallon cowboy hat on in this very stark stone Nazi fortress. And then all of a sudden, and this country western like 15 piece band kicks up behind him cast in this like really weird like orange light and then i realized oh right because they're in the the western zone right like it's so obvious but so great and when the movie leans into moments like that i i loved it I agree. I got this oddly Lynchian vibe here mixed with like some David Byrne. I don't know if you've watched any movies starring no. David Byrne, but they're just they, they always have these the big weird hat. moments like this. The big hat. Yeah. And you've got like the bison head that's just sticking out of that concrete wall. I mean, again, artists behind the scene. There was an art to it that entertained the hell out of me. And I, I really, really appreciated that. And then you add in a dash of like Janet Jackson Rhythm Nation. I was feeling the vibe. Yes. <laughs> And although I'm not a big fan of David in this movie, the people who are supporting him, his supporting cast and those resistance fighters that he finds himself uh, entangled with, they're pretty great. Jess is this woman who's leading this resistance like strike force. They're a surprising highlight in this movie. They're likable. They're near like inglorious bastards level of brutal and they're Nazi killing like she literally is following a soldier who's been shot multiple times and just plugging him again and again with her handgun. The disguises and tactics they use, for the most part, 
are believable, right? Yes, it gets a little hokey at the end, a little A-team, but early on in the movie, I mean, they're just doing things that normal people could do. And this dystopian world, as you mentioned, Ash, that's been created for them, it feels thought out, but simple. I did discover, because I wanted to look into Jess, who I thought did a fantastic job in this movie, like Courtney Cox was on set for two days as Jess. Uh, She quit. I guess she wanted to go dance with Bruce Springsteen or something like that. And instead, we got this Jess, who I think was a remarkable upgrade. I have to tell you, when I read your notes, the idea of Courtney Cox in this role would have made this movie just an utter disaster. Because like you, Gene, like I hated David, but I really liked the supporting cast. And I loved the Rebels. Like I thought they were such a great, like, you know, tone shift. I thought they brought a lot of energy to the movie that it really needed. And I cannot imagine Courtney Cox in this role role at all like Jess needs to be a little like Jennifer Grey and Red Dawn mixed with a little Sarah Connor mixed with do you remember the girl in Aliens that had like the big gun in the front she had like the red bandana yeah her name yes. was probably like Garcia yeah or yeah guys or something yeah Jess is like an amalgam of like those three characters and because of that like she's this badass who's like battle worn but still hot you know and I love that about her character and about her and I don't know why they would save David, this crew, because like they're pretty cool. Like it seems like David's just a liability in a lot of ways because he's he's a dick and he's no fun at all. But Jess, I thought she was cool. So so I, I might have a Roger moment here. I need some help. And I I'm, I know I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I went back and watched it three times. We get to a part here where they're entering the final gates to get into their final zone. Mm-hmm. They don't know how they're going to do it. Mm-hmm. Jess says, follow my lead and I'll show you the trick. They go through. They're in separate lanes. David gets to the front. His picture comes up on the giant billboard. All the lights come on. They shine at him. He is busted. Now Jess returns to the line, cuts in front of a guy with his gun out. Obviously, clearly, there's like, you know, like when you're getting onto the subway, Gene, and you swipe your card to another one. She swipes her arm, they come through, and all of a sudden, everything's cool. Yeah. So what happened here was that David's face was on the screen. uh, And so it's meant to make you believe for a second as the audience that he got caught. But what really happened is she intentionally went into the wrong line. So when she scanned her arm, those lights came on because she was in the wrong line. Uh, so the soldiers point their gun at her and they tell her they shove her over to the other line. So when she shoves over, she bumps into David, scans her arm for both of them, and then they go through. Yeah, then it wasn't too clear. It makes make sense. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I thought, fuck, he's done. And then all of a sudden it was some Jedi mind trick. I'm That's like, what, what they the wanted. Hell? They wanted you to think, fuck, he's done. By the way, uh, you'll, you'll appreciate this, Mark, from Minneapolis. Marjean Holden, who plays Jess, also from Minneapolis. She's a martial artist. Uh, and a stunt woman. Also, fun fact, six feet tall. No way. Yeah, she's a battle axe. Wow. That Marjean Holden. She does not look that big. Yeah. She's crouched over for David. Because he's a burden. Ash, you know why Marjean Holden didn't seem like she was six feet tall? Why? Brad Johnson is six foot three. Oh. There's a bunch of fucking giants in this movie. Just wish their acting was better. Yeah. Yeah. That's why his DNA was able to hold together. <laughs> to hold together. Big people, small performances. The Phoenix is revealed to be the same F-117 from Mailer's beam experiment. I don't know if you caught that, Big D. Accidentally sent back in time. While the aircraft was successfully teleported to Rammstein Air Base, it is also transferred through time, arriving in 1943 Nazi Germany. Mailer's father, Frederick Mahler, found it and told the Nazis it was his invention. Because of David's unique blood, he still knows the original history and is recruited by Longstreet to go back in time and prevent the Nazis' use of the F-117. The Mailer in this timeline has developed the same beaming experiment and knows that an injection of Herdig's blood will allow him to travel through time using the beam Uh, okay just reading that simplify it people a lot of things are good on their own we don't need to put them all in there simplify it yeah ash you've already highlighted the ridiculous nature of the dna component and the confusing mechanisms the whole machine's ability it not only goes through time and space but also geographic location I will forgive all that because that's pseudo magical science, but there's basic facts, laws that we can confirm that tell me this attack on Washington was not possible in 43. The Lockheed Martin, the Nighthawk, 
I went back and did some research because I'm thinking, okay, they steal it over Germany. It's in Nazi hands. They then nuke Washington, D.C. I would have gone after New York, but whatever. The combat range of a Nighthawk is approximately 550 miles. Germany to Washington, D.C., 4,000 miles. You would have needed multiple modern aviation refuels. And then the fuel that it uses, I'm thinking, would they even have the fuel to fly this plane? Yes, JP-8, which is Jet Propellant 8. It did exist, but it was refined over time. The, if you, you couldn't put jet fuel from Nazi Germany into a modern aircraft, it would not work. It's not formulated for it. This would not work. You wouldn't have made it. I don't, I don't get why they didn't do just something simpler. Take the nuke apart. Launch the nuke. You don't have a pilot. Is the pilot willingly now going to join you and fly the plane? Or did you miraculously take, turn a, 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 an air crew from Germany into how to fly a stealth fighter? People today can't even do it. Not to mention you can't just paint a stealth bomber. Mark pointed out that like the Luftwaffe insignia on it, stealth bombers are that color. It's not for fun or to look cool. Like they are that color because that is a special coating on the aircraft that helps it be stealthy. <laughs> you paint it, you just ruin that. But yeah, <laughs> why was it carrying a full armament? Who armed it? Yeah. The pilot was flying in the plane. How the fuck did he even land it for it to end up at Ramshin Air, Air Base? You, have either of you seen Indiana Jones, the new The Dial of Destiny? No. Am I going to spoil anything if I mention plot? I mean, not for us. No, because I will not watch it. Okay, so so there is a Nazi scientist who wants to... Well, that's, yeah, it's an Indiana Jones movie. He wants to use a, a, hist- a magical device of course. to go back to the beginning of World War II and kill Hitler. Sounds about right. Because he knows Hitler's going to make all these mistakes and lose. That's his objective. So who's going to be the Fuhrer? Goebbels. Uh, he's hoping that he will, uh, that he's in a position to assume power, or he he can influence the other leaders to not make the mistakes that they did. Like and so maybe, they're still going to be bad Nazis. It's just oh, going to yeah, be a different bad, bad Nazis. Nazi. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's almost like he would want to go back, kill Hitler after they've taken France, and just tell the rest of the world, we're cool where we are, everybody. Let's just stop. And the world might have listened. So he wants to change history at that point. You're not making me regret not seeing this film, but continue. Yeah. No, no. I'm just... well, but Ash, he does it in drag. Uh, and uh, well, he actually becomes Hitler's consort and then slips him ideas. Well, that sounds fantastic. Their wormhole also works like our DNA construct here. They end up actually in like in Greece. And he's hanging out with like Aristotle and some of the it's, it's, it's wild, okay? But we've seen now that that this isn't like Terminator, where you go back naked. People teleport and they, they change <laughs> with clothes, with guns, etc. Why are you sending back this bomber? Why not send back something like the nuke or send back even better information on how to build more nukes? Send manuals, modern technology like wireless communication, cell phones, lasers, drones, Modern computers. You could have made Germany the center of global development. Think of the United States and Japan mixed together. Why wouldn't you do that instead of the bomber? It's such a classic Big D moment where we had 45 seconds of preamble to get to, you don't go back naked. But. (laughs) Yeah, but Big D, I think what happened here, though, is that I don't think Mailer was planning on going right when he went. Like the plan was to get Herdig's blood, do all that stuff, and then go with like a package, like you were saying, what happened was Herdig goes and Miller's like, fuck, now I got to go because I got to get there and stop him. Uh, see, I think this goes back to our original disagreement. You think the Nighthawk going back first was a mistake? I thought it was intentional. I thought it was a strategic move. Yeah, but regardless of that, we're talking about alternate 1993 Mailer yeah. in this case. So he wants to go back and tell his dad, hey, make sure that the plane doesn't get blown up by its own blast. I would imagine he would also go back with things like you mentioned. I mean, things that would give Germany even more of an edge. But when he went, he had to go catch up with him, apparently. So he had to go do it really quick. Also, the lab's on fire and there's like explosions everywhere. So I think he probably wanted to, you know, get out while the getting was good. Just jump. Yeah. But what about the German security? You're now guarding this stealth plane from Mm -hmm. a wormhole. You see a doppelganger of the scientist with you come running at you disoriented with a gun. Yeah. Wouldn't you think this is a situation where we need to rally up, put him down, or secure the area? They let him get right up to the plane. <laughs> I mean, they pointed guns at him. They just didn't fire. But not in a hostile way. It was more yeah. like a suggestive. Like, hey, you know, just maybe what's going on here? A suggestive pointing of the gun? Yeah, it was at the ground. There was no 
They weren't Nazis being Nazis. Maybe they were distracted by the six foot three beefcake hanging off the side of a wagon <laughs> <laughs> on a wide open tarmac. When the resistance attacks Mailer's base, Mailer captures David and draws a vial of blood. As Jess and the others are gunned down, Hertig escapes and travels back to 1943, followed by Mailer. Mailer meets his father and tries to explain everything, but David destroys the aircraft and attempts to escape. Mailer shoots him, but Hertig kills Mahler, erasing Mailer from existence. David returns to the mostly original America in 1993, meeting Ben at his little league game where Jess is now the mother of one of Ben's teammates. So this is one of those movies that I was rooting for the main protagonist to get killed because then maybe the supporting yes. cast would like pick up because by this point in the film, like unlike you, Big D, like I'm just along for the ride. Like I I'm buying the choices at this point. I bought into the faulty science because it's fun. And then David kind of like comes along to like ruin it all. Um, he looks like he's in pain here at the end again, like he did at the beginning with the, you know, the, the weird time jumps that was DNA was being ripped apart. But at least there, the camera does that weird like thing, like the Wayne's were like, like where it gets all like wavy because they're, you know, going to a flashback. And so you can't really see him acting in those scenes. But unfortunately here, we don't have that technology. So instead he's just laying on the ground again he's looking like he has to like take a shit rather than being actually in pain the acting is the worst it is in the entire movie and i started to question like (laughs) whether or not we're being like punked with the bad performance by him because like there's no way like in the editing room that people didn't realize how bad of an actor and really genuinely he's one of the worst of the actors in my opinion that we've seen in our movies and it was a bummer because the movie's fun it's just he it's kind of makes it all wah wah well i have to ask you because you've watched the first was he doing a copy of the original david was the original david bad and boring maybe he was just copying that I mean, the character in and of itself is not that interesting, but no, I mean, like, this is, like, this is just bad. This is, like, B-movie, C-movie bad, because at least B-movie bad is fun. And Ash, you mentioned that you were rooting for David to get killed. I thought he was killed. I thought he's walking across that tarmac. He gets a bullet. It looked like it went clean through, like, a lung or something. That comes out the front of his chest. And after blowing up the Phoenix, he's doing this Blood of Heroes, like, slow walk. (laughs) <laughs> to this convenient time travel portal. Then he gets shot and we see that he's on the ground, but he's armed with a pistol. Mailer walks and stands right over his body. And then David, instead of shooting Mailer, he waits till the last second. He takes that pistol and he shoots <laughs> Mailer's dad, Mahler, who it's like a one arm shot belly down. He's fully prone. <laughs> and he's no shooting look. probably to what? 20 yards. Big D behind <laughs> at him. least at least kill shot. Boom. And that causes the portal to then zap Mailer into nothing. He does like a ah, zap, zap. He's gone. Okay, guys, this makes no sense in the world <laughs> that we've you. established so far. Okay, mm-hmm. so we know, as Ash mentioned, every time this happens, there's like a hole that's ripped in time space. Okay, so there's essentially four holes in time now. We've got the Eldridge. <laughs> Which went from 43 to 84 and then back to 43. That's one, okay? (laughs) David is two. He's his own. (laughs) He's got his own little thing going on. Then you got the F-117, which apparently, again, landed itself. (laughs) Landed itself in 1943 Germany. And then you've got now Mailer, because Mailer did a jump of his own, right? So each of them exists outside the bounds of time. Therefore, if you kill Mahler, it has no impact on Mailer. He's outside of the bounds of time. He now exists in the same time as his father. Therefore, he just exists. Anyway, regardless of all that, it's a huge gamble on David's part. If I'm in that scenario and I'm like, I think this is how time travel works. If I shoot his dad, yeah. he's not going to exist. What if it didn't work? Well, then he wouldn't make the baseball game. Like, that's, that's it. Right. Like, like, that's the only thing that would happen. Gene, I got to thank you. You're, you're at some future date, you're going to win a Nobel Prize for that breakdown right there. Thank you. It, some future generation, when one of these four wormholes collide yeah. and we wake up in an alternate time, they're going to find this and they're going to use you as the key. It's either going to be this or my breakdown of that fight in the Warriors. It's some of my best work. But wh- why not just cut your losses here? Just cut your losses at the end there. You've gotten this, this muddled ending. We don't know if he's dead. It leaves it as a cliffhanger for the future. What will it be? And this has got to be the final scene. And instead, the movie remembers 
wait, there's a Hallmark movie in here. We've got extra footage of Ben's baseball game. Let's do it. David just saved the world from German domination. He took a lung shot. He made a miraculous Annie Oakley, like prone backwards trick shot. Dude, walk away. Walk into the sunset. You're a hero. You're a badass. And instead, we got to go back to that Hallmark. The entire look of the movie goes back to that saccharine, sweet, saturated color Hallmark. We see the field and there's a game going on and David's there and Benny's like, hey, dad, how you doing? You feeling better? Yeah, I'm feeling better, son. Oh, that's great. And then we get a meet cute with Jess, who somehow, that's not how time works. You don't miraculously now appear looking exactly like you did. Single mom on the alternate universe here. That meet cute ruins it. Then Benny hits a home run. That kid's not that not athletic. What, are, <laughs> what have we seen that would lead you to believe Benny is going to hit a clutch home run. This movie ends on a Hallmark moment, and that's why I feel like that is the the better half of this movie. I also appreciate that he gets out of like a government black car and like runs up like, Benny! And my question in my head is like, where's Benny been? Like what happened after he saw his father disappear? Like who took care of him? Who's watching him? He just drove him. To, well, he's got like <laughs> eight cars to choose from. Right, he, he just drove himself to the baseball game. game. So, right. yeah, yeah. Where's Sorry. Child Protective Services? Well, now's the time in the podcast where we have our chat score for the Philadelphia Experiment 2. Our chat score is our way of telling you how many wipes this movie takes to get off your respected butts. Zero wipes is a perfect movie. It's when you are the code, the countersign, the godforsaken Western zone. And five wipes is an absolute disaster of a movie. It's when you save America but lose your pee hat. Uh, I'll go first. Uh, Philadelphia Experiment 2 struggled against several challenges, uh, a smaller budget, an all-new cast, a terrible leading man, and being the sequel to a time travel movie, which is always dangerous. Despite all of that, this movie was a fun watch. The Resistance seemed pretty cool. Dr. Mailer was a great villain, I thought. The Nazis were killed, and Benny finally got his home run despite wanting to be a pitcher. I'm going to go with an average wipe score, two and a half wipes. No, I think you're far too kind, Gene. As someone who loves time travel movies, I will take complexity. Like Primer, after you watch Primer, you need to break out some sheets of paper and write out what you've witnessed. Your head will hurt. This movie made my head hurt. It's too complex, too contrived, too ridiculous. You would have done better with either not making it or giving it a couple extra million dollars. It, it was it was pretty rough, people. You, This is a 3.75 white movie. Uh, thank you for, for making me watch it, and thank you for the month. But this one, no, I'm glad I missed it. Th- those 20 years ago. I don't know. I mean, I, I think that's a little cruel because um, I'll be honest with you. I was not convinced of this when this started, that this was going to be anything below a four white movie. I didn't love it. But then like the movie started to lean into the crazy and I enjoyed the crazy. I thought it was really fun. Um, once they got to the alternative reality, I, I really liked it. Um, I was able to just like suspend reality, enjoy the movie. And I would argue it would have been a much higher score than the one I'm about to give it. If David hadn't have been in it, he was the worst part of this film, but overall, like I thought it was good. I thought it was a completely average film. Um, Gene, I'm going to go right there with you. I think some Solidly average, right in the middle, 2.5 wipes. Big D, would you feel differently that if instead of Brad Johnson, they brought in Kyle McLaughlin? I would have liked that. Twin Peaks. Yes. <laughs> yes. Because he would have been weird as fuck. Yeah. Bring him in more like the scene of the of the the string band or whatever that Western. Make it more of that. You said they le- lean fully into it, and I would have loved it. Hmm. Well, there you go. We need a remake of the Philadelphia Experiment, too. Or do we? I don't know. No. I think it's fine at 2.5 points. No, there's a different timeline where that exists. I don't want to be on that timeline. <laughs> All right. With a unanimous two and a half wipes from me and Ash and 3.75 wipes from Big D, that gives us an average wipe score of 2.91666666, repeating for the Philadelphia Experiment 2. Uh, Gene, that now ties us in the 216 spot with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Flatliners, Needful Things, So I Married an Axe Murderer, and again, it happens. Blue Velvet. Oh. A McLaughlin film. There you go. There you go. I love Blue Velvet. I thought you were going to say Internal Affairs. No, it's all weaved together. There's some 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 master timeline where all these worlds are connected. All right. Well, thank you, Mark, for the month of Mark. Big D, we do have some email to get to 
this week, and it comes from Ryan. So Ryan writes in and says, good morning, chat crew. I've been a longtime listener and really enjoy both Shot on TV and the movie spot as well. I'm making my way through the back catalog of movie reviews, and I think I heard someone say recently that commissions had been opened up to movies from past 2000. I wanted to get some clarification on that. I must not have made it to the episode where that was announced yet. I love to commission a movie and wanted to make the best choice. Are you accepting commissions for 2025? I think at this point for later releases. And if so, what are the stipulations? Thank you again for all your hard work and endless entertainment. Ryan P S I miss Ash and hope she can come back soon. She was a huge upgrade over Roger. You asked for it, and here it is on on your doorstep. We've opened the door to the 2000s, yes. and uh, now Ryan's asking, what are the rules? Uh, it's a democracy. I don't know. What do you guys think? I know you're kind of- I think yes. I- I'm a no on this. Um, I like I like sticking to the 80s and 90s format. I think that 2000s and beyond should be for very, very special occasions. Uh, for example- for Ash, Eternal Sunshine being like a favorite movie of hers, I think that that's acceptable because it's one of the host's favorite movies. I think for Elf, it's a Christmas movie. I think that's okay. Like a birthday or something like that. I get it. If someone, heaven forbid, if like one of your parents died, not you guys, but if wow. a listener's parents died and or your kid dies or something like that and they want to see their favorite movie, I would see that as well. That does not mean you should all make up stories about why you want a movie done. But I would like – I prefer to stay in the 80s and 90s only because – only because there's so much more to explore, so many movies we haven't done in that area. Ash has mentioned The Ref. We haven't touched that one yet. So I would like to stay in that. But Ryan, if there is extenuating circumstances, I think that it could come to a shot vote. I am reliably going to be a no vote on most of these, just for the record. See, I think that we've got to take in mind like the distance from like the time period we're reviewing, right? So like I've been with you guys now for almost, which is insane to me, for almost five years, right? Like, yeah. I mean, that's crazy. And that five years has passed, which means like our distance from the 80s is longer, our distance from the 90s. I think there absolutely should be like a limit on it. But I think it would be pretty cool if we could go like 2005, like nothing before 2005. And maybe five years from now, we push it back further, but there's so many good, like early, like the early aughts that I think could be, and that's like very nostalgic. And I think our listening audience, like if they're my age, like that is like our nostalgia. So just throwing it out there. And I know it's arbitrary, but I kind of like that idea. Maybe each year we grow. Like if we said January 1st, you could do movies from 20, 2004. So we go 20 years earlier. So starting January 1, you could commission a movie 2004, then next year 2005, so it kind of grows with us. But Gene, as an audience, our audience is dying. They've got they've got reading glasses, they've got heart issues, they've got uh, you know, they're they're they've got rashes and they need Eloquist. We, we our audience is going to diminish, Gene, if we don't you know, we got to expand. <laughs> I mean, listen, we, we've we always practiced discretion in all these cases, too. I mean, Big D famously won't do anything that's sad about Jews or gays. And so, therefore, I think that even if a movie was from 1980, if it was a movie that's completely objectionable, we're not going to do it. Likewise, sure. I think that if there's a movie from the 2000s, it's exceptional that we would accept it. But I don't think we're going to do like any – like if it's not just like wide open, like, hey, this 2003 movie came out starring Mark Wahlberg, and we're like, yeah, we're going to do it. I agree. That's that's fair. No offense, Mark. I know you're listening. So write in if it's something special. Thank you, Ryan, for your email. Next up, we have a voicemail from Hot Sauce Steve. Hey, Shaq crew. It's Hot Sauce Steve here. A little birdie told me you guys would do Forgetting Sarah Marshall for me. I saw one movie from the 2000s already. Um, I will send the commission over. Unrated edition, though. The unrated edition is much better than the regular edition. So please go with that edition. And yeah, this is one of my favorite all-time movies, if not my favorite all-time movie. It's up there with Wayne's World and Dumb and Dumber for me, depending on how you feel about Wayne's World. Some listeners apparently don't like it at all, but I think it's the rating you guys have is perfect. So sending that commission over for Forgetting Sarah Marshall and so excited to see what you guys think about one of my all-time favorite movies. So there you go, Big D, another movie from the 2000s, Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Now, I'm on board for this one for a couple of reasons. One is Hot Sauce Steve has commissioned so many movies from us that he's, he's a longtime listener. And this is his favorite. Uh, I think beyond that, though, is that Forgetting Sarah Marshall gives us an excellent opportunity to see how Russell Brand has aged. And Oof. I'm very excited to have that conversation. I totally agree. But Ash, as a parent, you know, this is you've opened the door. You give the kids candy once late at night. 
They're going to start coming every day. We want more candy, more candy. The 2000s, it's becoming a flood. That's okay. I'm okay with it. I'm here for it. Although, forgetting Sarah Marshall, I don't know. Favorite movie ever, Hot Sauce Steve. That's that's a big, bold statement. I mean, I'll have to see how it holds up. Thank you, Hot Sauce Steve, for your voicemail. If you'd like to send us a voicemail, just go to shatpod.com. Use the SpeakPipe feature. And we promise, promise, promise we're going to get to more of these uh, in future episodes as we go into 2024. I uh, really like to get your voices on the podcast as much as we can. Big D, speaking of 2024, what's going to kick off the new year of Shat? When a novelist loses her man to a movie star and former friend, she winds up in a psychiatric hospital. Later on, she returns home to confront the now-married couple looking radiant. Her ex-husband's new wife wants to know her secret and discovers that she has been taking a mysterious drug which grants eternal life to the person who drinks it. The actress follows suit but discovers that immortality has a price. Commissioned by Sean V. Came out in 92. I did not know this was a Zemeckis film, but... uh, This is one that would be interesting. I watch this at least once a year. This is one of my favorite movies. My brother and I, every time we're together, at least once a year, we watch this. It is so good. Is there a War of the Roses vibe in it? Like old, married, angry couples bickering? No. Like War of the Roses, the movie, or War of the Roses, the historical event? (laughs) Either. Either. That would be a no on both accounts. No, no. Um, and the importance of this to gay culture, ugh, chef's kiss. Mwah. Beautiful. Surprise Big D is gonna let us do it. <laughs> oh, come on. I'm I'm not I just Holocaust movies, they they make me sad. Like I just like I was saying. As they should, because it's genocide. <laughs> genocide. I, I agree. Sad, I agree. But like I, I'm not against Schindler's list. Uh-huh. Thank you for thank you for stating that. <laughs> I'm not against like I even said like a, a Philadelphia. It was that it, the, Okay, it was that. What was it? The band marches on, or the band yeah. plays on. It yeah. was a a movie that people can't find. So that was my bigger issue mm. with that one. Uh huh. Just so I understand correctly, though, Philadelphia, no, Philadelphia Experiment, two, yes, no, I would do Philadelphia. Oh, okay, yeah, I said because it was you got Tom, Tom Hanks, Hanks, you got Denzel. It. It's a big film, Academy <laughs> Awards, yes, but a smaller film that was only like released on TV that people couldn't find, and maybe you mean not like that it, many... the miniseries that we did. You can find that they did a remake. Okay, no, I'm just making sure. I'm just making sure I understand the rules here. Was it was there a modern interpretation of of the band plays on <laughs> that I missed? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. There probably is. Somebody's going to write in. There was. I just appreciate that you said the Schindler's List is okay. At least we're all. <laughs> no, Gene made it sound like I won't do anything that makes me sad or involving the Holocaust. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Sean, for our upcoming commission. Thank you, Mark, for the month of Mark. Thank you to all our commissioners who make this podcast possible. That concludes this week's episode of Shout the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media, share with a friend. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shout the Movies. Email us, host at shatpod.com. Support the podcast by shopping our Amazon affiliate link, buying our merch, or by commissioning your own movie. Find all information by visiting our website, shatpod.com. Also, check out our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we review TV series such as Lovecraft Country, Westworld, True Detective, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, and Watchmen. Find all information on our website, shatpod.com slash TV, wherever we're fine podcasts can be found including Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. And if you stop by Apple Podcasts, please leave a five-star review. It helps the podcast grow. On behalf of my co-hosts, Big D and Ash, I'm Gene Lyons. Happy New Year, and be sure to join us next week for the following movie. Don't you know that it's worth every treasure on earth to be young at heart? Some people will go to any length to stay young forever. Is that someone? It's Madeline Ashton. She was a big star in the 60s. I thought she was dead. Oh, madam. You look younger every day. Thank you, Rose. But Madeline Ashton and her old friend, Helen Sharp. I've lost men to her before. Mad Hill! Are about to go <laughs> too far. A touch of magic. Drink that potion, and you'll never grow even one day older. Bottoms up. No warning. Now a warning? Siempre viva! Live forever! Ernest, I'm in the morgue. They think I'm dead. You are. But you're not. Are you telling me it doesn't hurt when I do this? It doesn't hurt. She's dead! She's dead, Ernest. Now he's dead. He's dead? Ernest is dead? You pushed me down the stairs. I'm so sweaty. I don't think it's.
did sweat, honey. I think you're defrosting. It's a lie. This summer, Universal Pictures presents Meryl Streep. Bruce Willis. It's a miracle! And Goldie Hawn. Look at me. I'm soaking wet. Death becomes her. I just have to make a telephone call. Brad John- I, was about, I was about to Google Brad Johnson hype, but you know how many Brad Johnsons there are? Yeah, why wouldn't you change your name? How many actors have a stage name? And Brad Johnson? <laughs>